out at noon is probably is likely we'll probably have a couple more people kind of join us as we go. Um, but we're going to get started. So hi, everyone. My name is Don Sauce here. I'm the Faculty Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Center, and our professional development series meets every Wednesday at noon. So if this is your first time, hopefully it's not your last time, because we have wonderful talks like this every single week. Next week, Camilla Roberts from the Honor Integrity System will come over and talk to us about what her office does and how we can help our students succeed um, and maybe do things a little bit more with a little bit more integrity uh, in their work and avoid some of the dishonesty issues that are really not fun to deal with. So she'll talk to us a lot about how prevention is much better than intervention. Um, that's a need to know event, by the way, for those of you who are pursuing our TLC professional development certificate. Yes, we do offer those both for graduate students and for faculty and staff. So you can check those out. And um, if you're a faculty member and you do things that enhance the teaching excellence of your colleagues, you can also potentially become a TLC fellow. And our uh, information for that is all online, but Ashley or Noah will probably drop that information into the chat as we're talking. So our event today is an excellent one. I'm really excited for the panel that we have, kind of talking about how we can introduce scholarship into our teaching um, and how we can do research on our teaching. So Jason Bergtold is here. He's, he's uh, recruited a wonderful panel, including Lisa Rubin, Kim Williams, and Andy Barkley. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to them. So thank you all for coming. Can't wait to hear what y'all share with us. So I, I want to welcome everyone. So my name is uh, Dr. Jason Berktold in the Department of Agricultural Economics, and I'm going to be kind of facilitating today's discussion. And as um, Don mentioned, we want to look at it. So how do we engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning? And so this is more of a discussion. So we'll have kind of three brief presentations by teaching scholars here at K-State, and then kind of an open discussion for people who want to kind of jump into this arena or find out more information or um, maybe take new different approaches that they haven't looked at before. And so that, that's kind of the focus here today is to kind of get new faculty, graduate students, even experienced faculty kind of into this area um, who haven't kind of jumped both feet first. And so in terms of our panelists today, so um, my name, I, I've already introduced myself. We'll have three panelists who are um, noted teaching scholars here at K-State, Andrew Barkley, um, and also in the Department of Ag Economics, Kim, Kim Williams at, from Horticulture and Natural Resources, and Lisa Rubin in Special Education, Counseling, and Student Affairs. And kind of just kind of an overview. Um, the purpose of today's talk is to explore the question, how do we begin to pursue and engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning? And so this is kind of really hopefully a first workshop on this, and we're hoping to follow this up in the spring with an additional one kind of to build on top of it. And so really three focused questions today, and kind of our objectives of this is, and, and to help you is how do you, how do you get involved? So how how do we get engaged in this if we're not actively um, pursuing this and we want to? And then what guidance do us who are experienced have for newcomers? Um, and that's also questions that you may have toward the end when we have our discussion time. And what is a successful SO scholarship of teaching learning, learning activity or endeavor look like? And so you'll hear that with some of the experiences from our teaching scholars today. And what should the outcome be? because I think that's a big one. This, this impacts not only students, um, which I think is our primary audience and stakeholder, but it's also administrative and even for professional development in the terms of promotion tenure in that, which has gained more and more discussion, at least in my profession, and I know in other professions, um, how do we recognize that in a broader sense? So with that and not taking up too much time, I will turn this over to our first speaker, um, Dr. Barkley. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, Jason and I are both lucky to be able to teach in agricultural economics, which is really a great place to be uh, with outstanding students. So I got here all the way back in 1988. It seems like it was just yesterday, but it's already been 33 years. And when I joined the department, there was a strong emphasis on research and specifically on referee journal articles. And I found myself really excited about teaching 
and so I got into scholarship of teaching and learning for the simple reason that I was able to actually do some work that uh, was what I was interested in on teaching, but also counted as research. Uh, so it was really a win-win and it's continued to be that way. And I would argue that anyone can benefit from scholarship of teaching and learning because if you're uh, someone who's really interested in teaching, uh, if you write papers about teaching, it shows that you're capable of doing research and it counts as research. On the other end of the spectrum, if you are really excited about research, uh, you can use scholarship of teaching and learning to show your interest uh, in teaching. So in anyone in between, it's just uh, really a great thing to do. And I think it benefits uh, so many different people. Um, so I just have, uh, two short slides that I wanted to share to answer Jason's good questions about doing scholarship of teaching and learning. And um, this is just kind of a framework for uh, thinking about some ideas about it. Um, I like to start by identifying an opportunity to enhance student outcomes. And I think my main point today is uh, to try and do something uh, that enhances student experience and student learning. If you start with that, you can't go wrong. Um, the rest of it is kind of icing on the cake. But if you pick something that's going to improve uh, your classroom experience, you just can't help but win. So as an economist, I like to go straight to the biggest weakness of the class. I often find that the biggest gains are made um, uh, by trying to improve the, the worst aspect of the class or my biggest failings, my biggest mistakes, of which there's many. So I like to pick a weakness and work on that. But you can also choose a new uh, teaching practice or pedagogy that you've heard about uh, that you might want to try or do a survey uh, of students or other teachers to try and learn about teaching and learning. There's so many different things you can do uh, but I like to link it back to trying to enhance the student experience. Secondly, I like to implement uh, the new idea that I'm working on. And I try to keep in my mind that uh, the implementation, uh, I'm going to try and write a paper about this. And so I try to keep notes about what's happening with uh, whatever I'm implementing or doing or experimenting with. And so many different things you can do from really huge changes to your classroom, like the flipped classroom, or really small changes, like just having students uh, share with each other their thoughts about an idea that you're sharing with the class that day, or anything in between. I encourage people, if you're thinking about a big change, like flipping the classroom or doing collaborative learning, you can always just do it in really small bites. Uh, you don't have to flip a whole semester of a class if you're unsure about how it works and whether you like it or not. Uh, you can just try it for a single lecture and see if you like it. Uh, so no matter what size your change or your implementation is, I think you can figure out a way to do it that you're comfortable with and that you can learn from. The third thing is to evaluate um, what you've done. And um, I remember when I was in graduate school, I was working on a project with my major professor on prices of food in Mexico. And I ran some simple regressions and took them to my major professor. And he said, well, how did it go? And I said, oh, not very well. He said, well, why not? I said, well, there was nothing statistically significant. And his response was, well, you know, you learn just as much about things that aren't significant as things that are. And I would argue the same thing about scholarship of teaching and learning. It's okay if your experiment or your implement, implemented idea uh, doesn't work the way you thought it would. You're still going to learn a lot about teaching and what works and what doesn't. And it's important to gain that knowledge and share it with others. Um, so that's the evaluation portion. And then if you are interested in uh, getting some output from your scholarship 
of teaching and learning. I say completion is a, is a big part of it. Uh, a lot of times we do the first three steps, but then we've got projects that we never write up and publish. And now there's so many great outlets to publish scholarship of uh, teaching and learning that you can certainly find an outlet to get it published. And um, I like to use artificial deadlines by setting a, a deadline for myself that I can get something written up and done because it's great to do all this, but it's also nice um, to get an article out of it. And you can because there's so many great outlets now. Um, so uh, just to summarize my approach to scholarship and teaching and learning, um, I like to focus on the student learning part of it. If you start with that, uh, you're going to have a successful project and it, it really doesn't matter how far you get uh, in the scholarship part. If you're trying to implement a new idea that helps students learn, oh my gosh, it's worth it. Um, documentation is good. Uh, like I say, researchers can document their teaching. Teachers can document their research. It works well for everybody. So it's a powerful thing. And it's really um, just uh, following Jason's comments in the opening, it's really helpful uh, to a lot of different groups. Um, just trying something new for students is helpful for students. Um, it can be helpful for your professional development to learn more about your own teaching practices. And it can be helpful for other teachers if you share that. It, it's amazing whenever I read other people's scholarship about teaching, I'm always excited because uh, you think, oh, they have the same experience as I have. And uh, with teachers, I think that's really uh, comforting to know that we're all in this together. Um, so that's my take on scholarship of teaching and learning, and I'll be uh, glad to pass it on to the next speaker. So our next speaker will be Dr. Williams in the Department of Horticulture and Natural Resources. All right. So, What's great about this is um, everything I'm going to say is just totally going to augment what um, Andy was saying. Um, so I want to start off by mentioning that I'm a professor of horticulture, which I only mention because it gives me the opportunity to emphasize how SOTL has definitely helped me over the course of my career achieve tenure and promotion. It's a really important part of my academic career. While I also have other disciplinary research, because I do a lot of teaching and I love teaching, it's a passion, um, SOTL has, has given me that opportunity to uh, take my teaching and turn it into something that is countable in a lot of ways that uh, passion for teaching otherwise isn't. And another thing I think you should know about me is that when you scan the list of courses that I teach, I do uh, hands-on lab-based, there's always a ginormous lab associated with the crop production classes that I teach. So that's my passion and it's also the bias that I'm kind of coming at you from. My favorite definition of the scholarship of teaching and learning is that it's the systematic study of teaching and learning made public. So, so this fits really nicely with what Andy was saying, uh, because I think there are two really important things about that definition to highlight. The first is that it's the systematic study. In other words, we're you know, intentionally designing an evaluation or an experiment to um, you know, get a handle on what's going on with our teaching or and or the students learning. And secondly, the made public part emphasizes that it's not total until you take it across the finish line and publish it for peers, um, have it critically reviewed, present it at um, you know, disciplinary um, uh, meetings and so forth. So Jason asked us to speak about how we got involved with SOTL. And for me, I absolutely accidentally stumbled into it. Um, my story is that I uh, was tasked when I arrived here over two decades ago 
And you can kind of tell that actually, because I noticed there was like a Netscape um, browser icon in the corner of the slide. Um, I was tasked with uh, uh, teaching, uh, developing a course in plant nutrition and nutrient management. I had a colleague at the University of Nebraska who had the same task. And so we decided to do it together and um, uh, went after a USDA HEC grant. The grant required some sort of dissemination plan. So we were like, I don't know, I guess we'll evaluate what we do and then try to publish it. And so through that process, um, you know, I, I figured out that SOTL is a great way to generate peer-reviewed publications. So in other words, SOTL allows me to spend time answering questions about improving the learning of my students, just like Andy was saying, right? And that's something that I'm really passionate about and then get credit for it. So in terms of how to, to, to approach doing SOTL, the first step is just to simply have an idea, right? What's something that you can build a, a small SOTL project around? And um, as Andy said, I think, you know, thinking about some aspect of your course that's unique, maybe something that's perplexing you or something that you're curious about. Um, but regardless of what your idea might be, you want to ask yourself right at the beginning, is this something that many of the teaching colleagues in my discipline are going to be interested in? Because that translates to um, you know, the ability to publish it and have lots of folks interested in the outcome. So something that's unique. Um, here are some examples from colleagues um, across campus. Um, we have an experiential learning activity in a landscape irrigation course. So evaluating how students felt about that experiential learning, what they liked and what they didn't, and then making changes based on it. Um, was a SOTO project of one of my colleagues, uh, Kathy Lavis. Um, John Flyter in political science uh, had a Supreme Court simulation in his constitutional law course. So a unique, a unique aspect of his course that he turned into a SOTO publication. Something perplexing. Um, you know, something in your class where you just like, why aren't the students getting this idea? How can I teach it differently so that I have better learning outcomes on the assessments like the tests and so forth? For me, um, currently, one of those areas is uh, greenhouse terminology. So working with a, a graduate student who is passionate about teaching, we developed a reverse crossword puzzle assignment. And and then ask the question, does it make a difference in terms of students learning some of these tricky aspects of, of the terminology? Or just something that you're curious about, like colleagues who wondered if they could teach turf grass identification online versus having the actual plants at hand and how that would affect how well students learned to ID the turf or colleagues in vet med who were wondering how different audience response system question types affected their student attention. And I think, and again, something Andy said, right? SOTL captures your hard work for other people to use. Uh, I love using case studies in my classroom. They are a lot of work to develop. And so here are a couple that I worked on with um, colleagues with a great graduate student, Marcy Spa, and then um, colleagues where we had a high tunnels grant. And um, there's nothing more exciting than getting an email from somebody in New Zealand saying, hey, I have a question about this case study or learning that, um, you know, you've got like 300 downloads of your manuscript and you're like, holy cow, that's awesome. You know, other people can benefit from your hard work. And then um, you can take that kind of work and ask questions about student learning. For example, in this instance, um, I actually still use this case study in my, my, one of my classes to this day, um, some 15 years later. So, so with this example, um, we wondered if we just give the students this case study, would they learn as much compared to giving them a lecture on that topic. 
And so with the help of um, Laura Brandon, a social psychologist, we designed an experiment to answer that question. And as Andy said, learning about how students are learning in your class, I mean, the results from this research like kind of shook my world. I had a whole new understanding of how to be a better teacher um, based on what we found. And so my last um, item then is to um, note the second step, I think, of starting that process of, of, um, of doing SOTL, and that's to visit the literature. Um, you know, look at other SOTL research that's been done in your discipline and just get a feel for um, what type of projects have been published and how they've, you know, what do the statistics look like? What do the experimental designs look like? And um, over the years, uh, folks have said to me, you know, I'd like to do SOTL, but um, like there's no place for me to publish it. There's just nothing with my discipline. And my, my response is, I don't believe you. Um, I just don't think that's the case. And so this is a great resource. If you're wondering where you could publish your SOTL, um, check out this LibGuide, which is maintained by Illinois State University's library. And you can click on any of these disciplinary areas and it just lists places where scholarship of teaching and learning can be published. So with that, those were my thoughts in answer to Jason's questions and I'll turn it over to, um, our next speaker, if I can unshare here. So our next speaker will be Dr. Lisa Rubin in the Department of Special Education Counseling and Affairs. Thank you, Jason. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the things that Dr. Williams said and um, Dr. Barkley said are things that I feel are a common thread in this. So. I think I fell into scholarship of teaching and learning kind of inadvertently, and it's from work experiences, from teaching experiences and, and reflecting on teaching. So I, instead of preparing slides, I just wanted to show uh, two articles I have in this space that I think will be helpful to um, understand what kind of how this happened. So the very first piece that I published in this area is, is this uh, article. and. It, before I got to K-State, I taught at a small baccalaureate institution that was very young at the time, was under 20 years old. And so the institution was very geared towards uh, bachelor's degree students, but um, I taught a course that most students hate to be required, which is college and career success. And uh, what I wanted to do was see if the students felt or, or learned uh, that what I said they would learn on the syllabus. And so what I started with is this library article that a librarian shared about six word memoirs uh, about students in library courses. And I thought, oh, I'd love to adapt that to my class. So the very last 10 minutes of the semester for extra credit, I asked them to write as many six word sentences they could about what they learned in my class. And then I would read them right after and I was absolutely fascinated by what creativity and, you know, if they did learn something, which I hope they would. And so uh, I, I knew I needed to do something with this and it, it did not dawn on me till after maybe a year of teaching there. And I taught there for four years that I probably should use this data. And I, I, at this time, type of institution, there was no IRB. So they actually outsourced IRB in the system of higher ed in Nevada. And so I, I contacted their IRB consultants and got approval to retroactively use the first year. And then I started using informed consent forms with the extra credit assignment. And so collecting over 550 six word sentences um, led to a lot of uh, deep diving and reading and, and trying to figure this out. And I was able to come up with this piece. And what was really cool about it was it involved a lot of connections with people I never thought I'd engage with um, in in the college. And, and the first thing was um, a colleague in leadership studies here helped me identify this journal and helped me identify the theory I would use, which was amazing. And, you know, there's an angle in here I put about accreditation. And to get to that, I ended up connecting with a former department head that I didn't know from my department who was at the Idea Center. And he gave me the idea to look at accreditation uh, processes and um, how that might fit into this kind of work. And, and it really ended up being an interesting experience 
I presented this work at the conference on the first year experience in my uh, very first year at K-State. And actually it's how I met Don and Greg Eisline and others who had come to present at that conference as well, representing K-State. And so it was a really cool thing to actually meet colleagues at a conference rather than on our campus, which seems to happen to me a lot. But what I found in this, that it, from my teaching and scholarship experience with this particular piece was that I in fact did not succeed on one of the outcomes that I hope the students would learn. And that was the diversity outcome. And looking back at this early in my scholarship, you know, I wasn't strong enough to say that in a way that really made the point at the end of the article. And so it, it kind of gave me a lesson that I need to own my, my own mistakes as, a, as an educator so I can better become um, adept at teaching all of the outcomes and they're all very important, but that diversity outcomes are really important. So it helped me think about how to strengthen my language as well, moving forward as a scholar. And then the second one, uh, this one is really interesting because this happened uh, to come out of an experience I had when I was a full-time academic advisor at a previous institution. And I got called into the Dean's office and they told me that my expectations for uh, my students were too high uh, academically and that I was harming them by having uh, such idealism about their academic abilities. And I thought about this for years. I thought, is it harming students uh, to believe that they can get a college degree? And that this kind of idea. Uh, and so one uh, trip to a conference in a car with my department head from here to St. Louis, I had a lot of time to think. And I thought, I really need to study this somehow. And you know, lo and behold, I got connected with folks in different disciplines who had similar interests in studying mindset and that impact on students. And so I collaborated with uh, the folks here. Um, this is someone, Emily, someone in engineering education. She was at K-State and then moved on to Ohio State. Uh, Jessica Lane's in counseling education and, and Andy Weefald's in leadership studies. So we worked together on this and we started with faculty beliefs. So we studied faculty beliefs um, on the nature of intelligence. We had them take a mindset survey through Dweck, kind of modified it, have them take it for themselves and then take it for their students and uh, how, they, how they perceive students' intelligence to be fixed or growth mindset. And um, looking at all these different factors, we looked at age, position, rank, gender, uh, college, um, and, and the only significant finding that we had statistically was that teaching faculty have more of a growth mindset towards their students than tenure track or tenured faculty, which uh, was very interesting out of all of the other things, because we actually were really dead set. It must be discipline related or it must be age related, but it was not. And I think finding uh, that this is the case across disciplines was really intriguing and basically consider this a pilot study that you know, more can be done. I still wanna know, can advisors help or harm students with how they believe students can succeed or not in, in their uh, educational journey? And so these are things that are, are still on my mind. Uh, so that I think was just how I fell into those things. Um, and, and it ended up being really fun to explore, you know, am I successful as a teacher? You know, we sometimes we just list objectives or, and outcomes on our syllabus because we have to, and then we forget about them. And one thing that's really interesting is, you know, Canvas has a feature where you can actually input your outcomes and connect them to assignments. Uh, did people know that? I don't know. So these are things that we can implement and integrate. But I think the biggest lesson here for getting started is to collaborate. I, I don't think even though I single authored the item, you know, the first article, I did get help from other colleagues. And that did, I never would have known about that journal unless I had talked to uh, Carrie Priest in leadership studies. So I feel like you know, a lot of people want to help each other out because we all have the same goals. And as everyone said, I, I know in the College of Education, it's highly valued that we um, think about our teaching, uh, whether we you know, just make changes or we study it. Um, and I also have to plug the assessment office on campus because I definitely did reach out to Fred Barak when I was doing that six word memoirs article and get some assistance on assessment literature as well. And that really helped me get to know some more resources as a new faculty member here as well. So I will turn it back over to Jason. So thank you for all three. I, I guess I'll, I'll just put some closing thoughts because I think in terms of some really great points came up by Andy, Kim, and Lisa. And I think, um, and I, one thing I really liked about Andy that I think should be stressed, and it's something that's helped me 
when I've been exploring ideas is our failures in the classroom. One is don't be afraid to fail if you try something new. But sometimes those failures have led to spectacular innovations, especially in my class, and totally restructuring sometimes how I do things. And that can lead to really great SOTO projects. Um, uh, and, and then something, Lisa, I think you brought up, which is key, is and is not only working with collaborators in your own discipline, but crossing disciplinary lines and how rich it is to bring in other disciplines, methods, and approaches into our, our classrooms where I, I still think we tend to look at teaching, at, and I see this in Ag Econ a bit, we, we, look at, we still look within our discipline at teaching rather than looking cross disciplines. And SOTL is really an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary um, kind of field. And so I, I think reaching, in, reaching for people other departments across universities um, is, is kind of a, a, a way to engage too. And, and thank you for bringing up like the Office of Assessment and stuff, because I think those kind of resources are key in terms of saying, well, how do I measure this in my classroom? Um, and, and that's something I think um, we fight with quite a bit of turning, how, how do I know if I was successful or not? Um, I, I think one of the other things that was really interesting as well is, and, and Kim, you, you mentioned this, I, I think quite a bit in terms of outlets, it's, it's crossing that finish line in terms of not just a published article. Um, and so I was gonna share this real quick just from one of my biggest experiences and developments on my views of SOTO as becoming a journal editor. And so I, I, I started a journal for our national association called Applied Economics Teaching Resources. And um, a big discussion on, in, in the creation of this journal was not just, um, and, um, was not just in terms of peer-reviewed publications, it was how do we get impact for professors for promotion and tenure? And so unique things we did with this journal and discussions and for a later future date are things, as the editor, we, we track not only downloads for articles, but most supplementary material is by request only. So when we publish case studies, all that is by email request. We track and actually survey users about what they're using these materials for. And then we pass that information at the end of every year back to the uh, primary authors. Um, and so they actually know not only classes it's being used in, in universities around the world, how many students are being impacted. And so we're trying to think of how do we, and, and that's a bigger discussion, but outlets in terms of finding outlets like that, that are open access, have those types of resources. I think the other thing that we really did is we started an online teaching database portal for our discipline, um, but there's a lot out there. There's, there's a whole, um, there's journals and a whole conference on case studies um, where it's very rich across all disciplines. And so there's a lot of resources that are online and available, um, but uh, if, if you do something and you don't have the time to say publish it, you can still kind of get it online for people to be able to use. And so I think, and, and there's a lot with that in terms of, um, I think Brian Linshield with like the Libre text and stuff, if you're building online courses, those materials are available to others. And so I, I think crossing that finish line is think, think broader for your outlets than just research conference presentations or an actual publication. Um, and I, I, a future discussion is always how do we sell teaching scholarship of teaching and learning for promotion, tenure, and reviews across the, all the disciplines? That because that becomes very discipline specific. As Andy said, in our our department, it used to be in our field, it used to be very much peer reviewed publications, and teaching was secondary. And that that culture has changed across a lot of universities. So. And, and so that's kind of closing statements in terms of um, what uh, kind of pivoting. What I want to do now is open it up to the audience um, for questions and questions for discussion. Um, if anyone, if, if people don't, I, I, I have some questions I can put to our panel in terms of 
um, starting discussion, but if people have questions, that would be great. I'll start with that. Hey, uh, I'm gonna ask a question if that's okay. Yep. Um, everybody, super awesome stuff. I'm really interested in this, so it's, uh, it's really important. I think y'all did an awesome job. Uh, I was wondering, uh, the second speaker, I think that was Kimberly, um, uh, kind of spoke on this, but I was wondering if you all could kind of individually speak on your, I don't know if the motivation is the right word, but for like research questions, is it like things you're kind of doing and you wonder if it's working? You hear a method? Do you do an extensive subtle, you know, literature review before you kind of decide uh, uh, what you want to do? Where does, you know, how do you kind of go uh, about that? I think the inspiration can come from a lot of different places, for sure. I, every single thing that you said could be inspiration for a SOTO project. And um, for me, a lot of times it originates in my classroom, or actually also sometimes um, interest of graduate students that I'm working with who are really interested in teaching. And I, you know, encourage them to think about a SOTO project that they might want to incorporate into the teaching that we're doing together. So I can think of a, a student who really wanted to look at that experiential learning piece and um, ask some questions around that. And so, you know, it, we, you know, again, that intentional design, how can we design an experiment in our classrooms? where we can answer or, you know, if not answer, at least address that question in terms of how um, our instruction is going. Turn the floor over. Yes, I would um, just like to add to that, that uh, I, it's helpful for me to view SOTL as a package. So um, I try to think of ideas that would enhance the classroom, enhance student learning and uh, would also be something I could write up and either present or publish. And um, with journals like Jason's available now and an increasing interest in SOTL, I really think you can find uh, good outlets for almost anything. So it's a diversity uh, of things you can do, um, some large, some small. But I like to think of the whole thing as a package. So while uh, I'm working together with other teachers to implement the idea. We're thinking ahead towards um, writing it up all in, in the same package. I just mostly pointing out what uh, Kimberly shared before, the examples from all these different um, areas on our campus that she knew about or highlighted from vet med or from political science. What it's really cool is it, we can learn from each other and we don't need to be in the same discipline. and. I think for me, I mean, this was very eye-opening, but you know, most conferences, those research presentations are 15 minutes. And um, at the conference on the first year experience, I got an hour and I was put at the same time as John Gardner. And if anyone knows, that's the person who founded like the first year experience at South Carolina. And he has an institute and grants for that and all sorts of things. And so I thought, well, no one's gonna go to my presentation. And I think because his room was full, then mine got people. And um, it was so cool to be able to share that with people who are in a variety of disciplines. And then I always thought like, you know, I'm, I'm wrong right now, but I always think that that six word memoirs piece is so fascinating. I'm still intrigued by the fact that I got to do it, but I'm, I was thinking when did, that's gonna be my most cited work or most read work or something. It's not, but you know, it's getting people who are not just education scholars that read it. And so I think what's really cool is that I took it from the library scholarship and I put it into this and now someone can take that idea and use it in any field. And it's, it's fun, it's, it's fun to do for students. It's helpful to know, did I successfully teach what I said I was gonna teach? So I think that um, being creative is the best thing about it. And I, some of the things I've implemented in my classes have been total fails. And unfortunately, you know, for Andy, I haven't uh, published on them, but I got ideas from other just I reached out to leadership studies and they said, oh, I help. I have the students make up the syllabus the first week of school and then they're accountable to it. I'm like, oh, let me try that. Didn't work in my class, but I tried it, um, but it worked for him, you know, so I think it's something that you can trial and error. And then if you if you see interesting things come out of it, then it can turn into something more. Uh, I, I guess I'll add my, my two cents, but in in terms of, I, I think you can also think broader even outside of the classroom and how other exper student experiences impact their experiences in the classroom or experiences at university. And um, 
I know for me, COVID was a huge, I think we had a lot of questions going on in education. It was a, just as a teacher, there was a lot of questions that got raised. And so that's what's guiding my Kaufman research this year, but, um, and, and how, how we move forward after it. But I think in terms of, I've always been interested kind of in these broader, like I'll do these individual studies in my classroom, but I, I get more and more excited of looking across universities and, um, I think every time I do a study or start one, it raises more questions than I answer. And so there's, there's always another question that pops up or something we didn't think about. Or as Lisa said, and Andy brought up, sometimes it fails. And <laughs> that leads to other questions. And so the great thing is, is it, it, it builds on, um, I, I think it can build on itself once you get started. There, there is some self-momentum there. I know Colby Morberg in Morberg, sorry, in the chat had a question. What funding sources have you used to fund subtle experiments? My funding. So I'll say, yeah. Go I ahead, was going to say my funding has mostly been internal sources. Um, it's amazing how many places around the university are willing to fund this type of research if you just ask them and tell them about it. So at the university level and the college level, um, we've taken advantage of just asking um, and having a good idea that might uh, help students. And uh, lo and behold, the uh, people have been forthcoming uh, with internal funding. There are some um, national funding opportunities, uh, USDA Higher Education Challenge Grants, and um, a lot of times there'll be large grants that have a teaching component. So, you, you know, you can fit into that component of a, of a broader disciplinary scoped grant. I, I think there's other, um, I, to, mimic what Andy said in terms of, I've gotten quite a bit from internal. Um, and also there, there are grants through NSF, USDA, um, if you wanna do specific types of educational programs. Um, and I know they offer like graduate training, there's undergraduate research grants for undergraduate research experiences that include educational components. Um, as well as um, there's like international, those could be international or national. Um, and so a little, I, I think part of it is being creative. There are also private foundations that fund this type of research as well, depending on, and, and so a little bit it's being creative because part of your SOTL may be, um, we tended to couch a lot of some of our SOTL questions in broader research questions. Like how do we impact the student body for agriculture or something? Um, and the, and so kind of think, think broader impacts sometimes in terms of when, when you're thinking and that, that might lead you to funding sources you traditionally might not think of. And it depends how big, how much money you're looking for too. <laughs> but I, I think NSF, NIH and USDA do fund this type of research, but I think it tends to need to be a, a little bit broader and there, there needs to be kind of an associated research component or question with it. So, but I have seen projects on that end. Um, yeah, Jeremy Cohen mentioned the Spencer Foundation funds teaching education. So I, we've applied there um, and that was one I was thinking of. Um, Gail Hawk asked, talk about your IRB approval process for classroom SOTO projects. Yes, I could start. Um, uh, it's a process which changes over time and um, become more sophisticated uh, as the years pass. And um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, if you contact IRB, they're really great to work with. Uh, really excellent people who do everything they can to help you. And um, if you're doing a survey project, uh, there are some modules uh, that you um, learn from and pass some quizzes online. And once you're through with the modules, get the paperwork done, 
they approve the project and you move forward. Um, but it uh, it's very straightforward. I think if you contact IRB, it just gets the ball rolling and it, it's quick and easy after that. I'll add to that. So I, I serve on IRB and um, I mentioned, you know, with the previous institution, I got like retroactive approval kind of in the middle of the project and kept going. I, I it dawned on me that I had pretty unique uh, project that students did here at K-State that I thought, oh, now I've you know, been here seven years. I probably should have got done informed consent a long time ago. And I reached out to Heath and he said, no, you cannot use old yeah. uh, assignments. And so I felt kind of distraught and decided I don't, I don't even want to apply and keep going with it because I feel like I lost a lot of great data. But uh, so just know that if you have something that students have already submitted and you want to use that, it's not going to be approved. And so you just need to plan a little bit and use only moving forward things that are proof uh, after the human subjects review. Don brings up a really good point related to this as well, um, is that um, if you're, if you you might need to get the office of the registrar involved. Um, so if you're using grades, even if it's assignments or grades, and this is something I learned going through this process is you need to make sure you um, also don't violate FERPA. And so just because you have IRB approval does not mean you also um, have, I would say FERPA approval. So you need to, there is a separate document after IRB that you submit to the office of the registrar if you're going to use grades or if you're using any data pulled from cases. And so we've done studies where we actually pulled data from cases that are larger. And so, cause we're doing multi, more university wide or college wide thing. And so then you need to get office of the registrar approval for that. Um, and the other thing that I was going to mention, and I think Lisa, you brought up, which is an awesome point, think ahead. And I, I think thinking ahead is a, a, probably a best practice for IRB is develop the informed consents and have your students sign an informed consent. Um, it meets not only the IRB requirements, it'll help meet FERPA requirements. And so having a sign, not, not in a survey, electronic is really great, but having them physically sign an informed consent document. So you spend time in class. And so when I do this in the class, I did it this year in one of my classes, we do it at the beginning of the semester. And so I'll spend that first day talk or the second day talking about that in depth a little bit, what we're doing and going through that process. And Gaya mentioned right now the exempt IRB approval is very quick with a well-written application. And I will second that. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had mine go through. So, so Jason, if, if I can amplify something I've heard you and some others say is that when you're doing SOTO research, it's important to remember that it's, it's research. And that you should you should come at it with your researcher hat on. It's not I had a cool day in class. Let me write a paper. It's it's done intentionally. We often have hypotheses. We have control groups potentially. You know those can maybe pre test, post test kinds of things. So we do it with our research hat on. It's not just we write about the cool things that we do. It's the cool things we do might inspire the research project. And I think all four of you very nicely did that. But I just want to make sure when we leave here, it's not like I'm going to go around all these papers about this cool stuff I did is no, put your researcher hat on and then go look at that cool stuff and evaluate how that cool stuff works. And, and I, I also want to point in, since I'm an editor of a journal, um, there are journals. So we do scholarly scholarship research of extension and teaching scholarship. But one of the areas that of our journals teaching and educational methods. So people who develop new methods and approaches that have some, we ask for some type of evaluation experience, implementation, discussion in those papers, but we don't require a formal, it's not a research paper. It's more, hey, I'm doing this in my classroom. I want to explain it and make it available to a broader audience. And we did that as a peer reviewed publication. And that was one of the reasons our journal was actually started was to provide that access. So I, I would say I agree with Don. I think you need to have that question in mind. Um, but think of, and, and it's something that comes out, think of 
outlets don't always have, to, I guess you can have a research paper for it, but there can also be a methods paper um, that comes out of this that really highlights the methods, has the associated teaching note for it. Um, and that's the way I tend to look at my projects if I'm doing something like that, because then we'll do the research after because we need to do it over, we're doing it for three or four years. And then we'll publish the bigger research, but sometimes we'll look at a methods type article as well to get the methods out there and kind of talk about implementation and how it failed and when successful and what happened in our classrooms, more than just the actual data. So uh, just, just know there's other types of articles as well. So even commentaries at times, so. Yeah, I think I can also just tie this back into something that was emphasized a lot with regard to getting collaborators. I can say that um, as a plant scientist, like I didn't know anything about human subjects research when we got going. And so that was really a great, uh, you know, a, a necessary thing for me to like team up with folks around our campus who did know human subjects research and, um, you know, learn from, from them about how to design, you know, decent experiments and so forth. Um, with our students who are indeed humans. <laughs> I also want to point out something. We were talking about uh, how to potentially get this funded and get the support for this. Um, one way is to potentially become a Kaufman chair. So uh, if, if this is something is you have a goal on your career radar, but I think there are four Kaufman chairs in, in this meeting right now. I think uh, me, Jason, Andy, and Kim are all Kaufman chairs. And Kim, I think your project was on doing social research. It was, it was kind of help increasing that around the university. Jason doing something similar this year as our current Kaufman chair. So there are these ways. And if you become a Kaufman chair, you get a research assistant uh, for the whole academic year and you get a teaching release each of the semesters. So they provide some of that space, time and resources to do these kinds of things. So for those of you who are maybe kind of thinking about, you know, where your career might go, that might be something to put on the to-do list to check out because your project, you have to have a project as a Kaufman chair could be based around you getting your SOTO program up off the ground. I think the one last question was for Melissa Glasser on what important areas of SOTO do you believe are missing? in publications at the present time. I'd like to hear what you say, Jason, since <laughs> your experience um, with receiving the different publications, um, what's your idea on that one? So I, I think what Lisa said, so I'll preface this with their and what Kimberly brought up that website, Lisa got mentioned there are publications we don't even, I didn't even know the Journal of Sotal um, existed and, and I wanna go look it up. But, and, and so there's all these journals that exist that are either multidisciplinary or in other disciplines that exist. And so there's a wide range I haven't even dug into. Um, but I, I know some areas, Kim, you mentioned, there's always a need for case studies, especially up-to-date, relevant, um, and cutting-edge case studies. Um, and case studies can either be experiential um, or active learning type exercises, um, or they could be something where you could use in a flipped classroom where some of that's done outside. Um, and so that's a big push for my journal, but and one, having a home to publish those. Um, but that was, that, that for me is one of the bigger ones. I think the need is we need professors who are doing awesome things in their classrooms to publish it. And that's why I, I'm pushing published methods, commentaries. I, I've talked to people who are like, I don't have the time. And I'm like, write me a 2000 word commentary. Um, it doesn't need to be, they're peer reviewed. Um, and, and so they go through the same process. And for me, that is a big, there's a lot of great things, even at K-State, that we hear about at say the spotlight or um, similar events, but then we, you don't get the depth out of those sometimes. And so having the publications or some type of outlet where you get the details of it would be great. And that's what I think is missing because a lot of the times, um, I think um, the Kaufman chair a couple years ago brought up that a lot of the people who are really successful in Soto, Soto are also very successful in the other parts of their career. 
So, and I talk to a lot of people who are great teachers and are really busy and it's getting them to write that article <laughs> or, or do that because of other commitments. And so really the need is, I think of teaching methods and applications and having those, because I think what happens is we find them repositories are built, but then they're lost. And we've seen that in economics. We've had some really great active learning databases that are now gone. And it's really upsetting because we had a lot of games and stuff around the 2000s and 90s and early. And I do a ton of active learning and I know Andy has in his classrooms and a lot of those are gone now. And we're losing the historical sides that have been successful. And so now we're having to republish them because we can't find them anymore. And so having outlets that are publishing those that are gonna have a long-term record keeping um, is also needed. And so that's probably my two big ones. Um, as a new editor still, I, I still consider myself new since this is my fourth year. Um, but I, I, I'd say those are probably two of the biggest. I, I always think there's research on evaluation. Actually, I'd say the two other areas, there's a big question on how we use it for P&T. Um, and another big area that has been a ton of discussion, even at K-State, student evaluations. How do we evaluate student learning objectives and teacher effectiveness and learning? And how should we be doing that? So those are huge discussions um, that are um, big subtle areas. So, <laughs> and so that's kind of. So Jason, I wanna, I wanna go off that and say two things. Number one, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll talk about faculty focus here in just a second, but if you're doing anything on campus, Send it to us at the TLC and we'll promote it. If you published an article, we'll let people know about it over our social media and in our newsletter. If, if you have an idea, we can help you get that out there for people. Because if you're worried about the publication process being you know, too much of a completion, you know, and, and I think as Andy said, this, you should want to get it there. As, as Kim said, there's advantages to getting it there. But if you're kind of looking for something a little bit less formal, we can help you out with that. We, we can put it out over social media. If it's a good idea, we'll help you get it out there. Um, Another place you could potentially get this out, and this is not a peer-reviewed publication in the same way as Faculty Focus. Thank you, Melissa, for, for bringing this up in the chat. Faculty Focus, if you, if you aren't aware of this, is a daily journal, basically. It's, it's more a newsletter than an academic journal, but every single day there's an article or two on teaching practices. I, you can sign up. It's free. You can get these sent to your inbox every morning, get this every morning. Sometimes the articles are not things that I'm interested in. Sometimes they're great, but you can also publish there. What happens is you write a piece and they want you to be informal. So it's more of an idea. It's not sharing your data in the way that you might, but you can write your piece in 900 to 1300 words. It's not that hard to do that. Uh, Noah, Ashley and I submitted there yesterday. The, the review process is a couple of weeks and then it shows up if it gets accepted within a month or two. So it's really a great idea, not only to get ideas, but also to share your ideas in kind of this, this early fashion that you might have. You did the cool thing when I tell people about it, but don't have data. This is a place where you might be able to put that out there. I'm not going to say it counts the same on my publication record as a peer-reviewed publication, but it does show people that this is something that I'm invested in. And Nora Ashley, would one of y'all drop the link to Faculty Focus in the chat? And someone asked, I dropped the link to AETR as well. So we are just about out of time. So Jason or any of our panelists, do you have a final thought that you would like to add before we close this up? I guess for me, a, a final thought to maybe be the last one to speak is if, if you wanna get started in SOTL, Start, get, start by getting innovation, being innovative in your classroom. Just try something and then, um, or something that you've seen someone else do. And so that, that's kind of a great place to start. And then, then start thinking about what Andy and everyone else talked about, putting that process together and thinking about building that into an idea and expanding on it. Thank, Thank you so you much everyone for that, Jason. For I would, like to, I would like to extend our thanks. Please join me in thanking Kim, Lisa, Andy, and Jason for having an amazing panel. As Jason already uh, 
kind of foreshadowed, we'll be having a follow-up to this in the spring semester, we hope, we kind of maybe talk a little bit more about where these research projects could go and how they would happen. I would imagine each of our panelists would also be very interested in you following with email questions if you had any after this event. Um, I'll remind you, we have a post-event survey that you can uh, complete to let us know how you thought this went. And next week, we're going to talk about academic integrity, the bigger picture with Camilla Roberts from our honor and integrity system. So once again, thank you so much for our panelists, and we'll see you next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. That was awesome.